Near the end of chapter 9 in Ursula K. Le Guin's second Earthsea novel, The Tombs of Atuan, within the scope of a single paragraph, there's something incredibly important sketched out there that Ged explains a little bit in ways that connect it to what's been going on beforehand and prefiguring what's going to happen right after that, their escape from the tombs and the beginning of a new life together. And it centers around one word, trust. And Ged makes very clear at the start that um, he says, call it trust. That is one of its names. So it's something that could be called by other names as well. This is not a very narrow and clearly defined notion. Instead, what he's, what he's signaling is a complex reality, something that has built up between them and which now places itself, you could say, at their disposal. He says, it is a very great thing. So we can talk about the power of trust and we could talk about all sorts of other synonyms. I mentioned capacity already, a sort of readiness, a sort of responsiveness to the other, a reliability, a confidence that comes about through knowing that you're in some sort of relationship that has a foundation that, that can be you know, expected to go on. And as he says that without this, each of them is weak. And in fact, in that, that very uh, chapter, what we see is Tenar, Arha, coming to Ged for a kind of consolation and to express her own helplessness. The, it seems to her that the old masters, the nameless ones, are actually dead because the other high priestess who doesn't really believe in them is in there digging up the fake grave, desecrating it, and, and she's probably going to either force Tenar to kill Ged or to die herself, as Manan has pointed out. So she's coming to Ged and saying, I can't actually deal with this, and Ged is there for her, just as she has been there for Ged, bringing him food and water, and even more importantly, companionship. So with trust, he says, each of them has a strength that they wouldn't have on their own. Now notice this, this is not the, you know, Uni uh, separate were weak, united were strong, as if somehow just being united or being together makes each individual strong. There's three things here. There's Tenar, there's Ged, and there is the trust uniting them, the trust between them, the trust that has developed, which is not a person, but is something like an entity. There's actually a fourth entity, as we're going to talk about in just a moment, that's going to help them out of there. And then Ged recounts how this developed. And, and you can read backwards into the previous chapters to see this happening, right? They develop a closer and closer connection. They reveal more and more of themselves. It begins rather antagonistically. As Ged himself says, um, I came here as a thief, an enemy armed against you, right? And she was as well. But she showed him mercy and trusted him. And then from the moment that he fell into her power, he says that he trusted her from the start. And there's a nice uh, additional line. I trusted you from the first time I saw your face for one moment in the cave beneath the tombs, beautiful in darkness. Right? So he's... Is he engaging in some flattery or is he just saying that she is indeed somebody who is beautiful? Uh, they have come to know each other. They've come to trust each other. And he goes on and he says, listen, you've already proven your trust to me. How has she done that? Well, by placing him in you know, safe places, like taking him from the painted room to the treasure room, by bringing him food, which she had to sacrifice uh, on her own part, fasting so that he could eat by bringing him water, 
by protecting him from Castle and the others, uh, Manan, who would, who would kill him, right? Um, so she's already done quite a lot, and perhaps even by asking him the questions, by engaging in conversation with him, by being another human being with him. Um, now it's time, he says, that he proves it. And so what does he actually do? He says, I have made no return of that trust. I will give you what I have to give. And so he does two things. He says, my true name is Ged. We know the importance of true names, both in the Wizard of Earthsea and, of course, in the, the, the earlier story, the rule of names. But there's also a passage in which he tells her about names and why ordinary people in Earthsea don't give out their names in what she calls the inner lands, but especially wizards don't give out their names. And so he is giving her his name. He is making uh, himself vulnerable to her in a way that she'll actually, without meaning to, test later on when she uses his true name when he's in disguise. So he's going to do that. But he also takes the fragment of the ring of Erith Akba, and he says, you've already got the one you took from me. I discovered this in the uh, treasures. This is what I came to seek. It's yours. I trust you with it. And so he's giving back to her um, what he can. And this is kind of an interesting thing to point out, a bit of a digression. But when it comes to trusting other people, developing this sort of relationship that is not just R.E.R., Tenar, and Ged, but Le Guin is pointing at something that's really fundamental to human existence here. We, we often don't give and take at the same time. One gives before, or it's over the course of time, and we don't always give the same things, do we? It's, it's not possible very often that for there to be strict equality, perfect reciprocity. Sometimes one will give more, one will give less. And it depends, you know, who's giving more depends on the perspective that you're, you're looking at, doesn't it? So this is a, a very important uh, set of points. Now, trust allows them to get themselves out of their situation, but how does it do so? As, as they say before, um, Ged says, um, here we go, a little bit earlier. Tenar says, they would not let us get out ever, right? The powers, the, the dark ones. And he says, perhaps not yet it's worth trying. You, Tenar, have knowledge. I, Ged, have skill. And between us we have, he paused, she brings up the third thing, we have the ring of Erith Akba, which is not yet reformed at this point in time. It's still broken. And this is where he says, yes, that. But I thought of another thing between us, call it trust. So the trust between them is what allows her knowledge of the labyrinth, of the undertombs, of the ways things work in the, the temples and Kargish society to be useful. His skill, his magical capacities, which he's already using to hold back the uh, old powers of the earth that otherwise would be, would be destroying them. And then they have the ring, which in the very next part of the, the following chapter is going to be reformed through a spell of patterning on the part of Ged, and then worn by Tenar on her arm. It's given to her. So they do have all these things, these advantages, but none of them would be really effective on their own and all together as the three without this trust between them. This is what permits them not just to act as one or be a unit or something like that. They actually have to reinforce each other as things are going on. Um, Ged, at one point in time, has to be very forceful with, with Tenar to get her to, to come with him. With that, they can escape the tombs, and they can face the power, the immense power, in their most powerful place of the nameless ones, the old masters, the uh, uh, old powers of the earth that Arha is the priestess of. Uh, whose wrath is being turned against both of them. 
So this is what allows them to make it out of that place. Once they do, trust comes up again in another set of important ways. There's a very interesting discussion. They're hungry, and uh, Tenor asks, well, you know, can't you just make some magic and make some food? And uh, Gad says, well, no, that I could, but it's illusion and you'd still be hungry. And then uh, she also says, um, here we go, can you find food for us? Hunting takes time and weapons. I meant with, you know, spells. And he says, I can call a rabbit. The rabbits are coming out of their holes all around us. Evening's their time. I could call one by name and he'd come. But would you catch and skin and broil a rabbit that you'd called to you thus? Perhaps if you were starving, but it would be a breaking of trust, I think. And this doesn't mean that they don't actually call a rabbit, but they don't kill the rabbit. In fact, he teaches her the word in the old speech, right, the true speech for rabbit, and she does call a rabbit by them, but they, you know, um, here we go. Uh, she says, that's lovely. Could I do that? Uh, the rabbit's name is a secret and all of that. Um, so why not call a rabbit? Well, because they're not in dire necessity. If they were, then that would be, in some respect, allowable, but it would still be a breach of trust on the part of Ged. Uh, using his magic to compel something, to give itself to him. They all, there's also a lot more about Ged helping Tenar face her future. And I, I really think there's a couple points that we should signal here. So in the end of, of chapter 11, um, he's, he's uh, telling her about the islands of Earthsea, um, she knew he was trying to hearten her, but she had left joy up in the mountains in the twilight valley of the stream. There was a dread in her now that grew and grew. All that lay ahead of her was unknown. She knew nothing but the desert and the tombs. What good was that? She knew the turnings of a ruined maze. She knew the dances danced before a fallen altar. She knew nothing of forests or cities or the hearts of men. She said suddenly, will you stay with me there? And he says, Tenar, I go where I'm sent. I follow my calling. It is not yet let me stay in any land for long. Do you see that? I do what I must do. Where I go, I must go along. So that, that sounds like he's saying, well, it's been cool, uh, kid, but I, I got I to gotta go do my job, right? But immediately after that, he says something to her that reinforces this trust. So long as you need me, I will be with you in Havnor. And if you ever need me again, call me. I will come. I would come from my grave if you called me Tenar, but I cannot stay with you. So this is a promise that he's making about coming, being with her while she needs him, but not staying for life. So this is a, a you know, very important way of understanding trust. The other thing that happens is there's a point where she actually considers killing him, right? He had made her follow him. He had called her by name and she had come crouching to his hand as a, the little wild desert rabbit had come to him out of the dark. And now that he had the ring, now that the tombs were in ruin and their priestess forsworn, now he didn't need her and went away where she could not follow. He would not stay with her. He had fooled her and would leave her desolate. She plucked the little steel dagger she'd given him. He moved no more than a robed statue. And there's, there's more discussion of this. And then he simply turns and says, Tenar, as if in greeting, and reached up his hand to touch the band of pierced and carved silver on her wrist. He did this as if reassuring himself trustingly. He trusts her not to kill him, not to out of her grief, out of her desolation, out of her despair to turn on him. And so she ends up trusting him yet once again because he trusts her. They have built up this thing between them that even though it doesn't take on exactly the contours that she would desire, it still suffices. So trust becomes an incredibly powerful 
an important theme within this, this narrative. 